Hello, welcome to video 4. What is material? The main material, part 1. This is going to be a multi part series discussing what the main material node is in Unreal Engine 4, the different properties, the different settings, and how it works. And hopefully, we will be able to cover the basics of it before we move into the individual material nodes themselves. So, this is your main material node itself. Whenever you create a new material, by default, when you open it up, it's going to have a main material node selected. If you click anywhere in the background, or if you click on the main material node itself, you're going to get the same results down here in your details panel. So that's how you'll access your main material node. At this time, there are 11 different sections for properties for the main material node. And then you have all of these inputs for the main material node itself. Now, what is the main material node? The main material node is basically, it uses HS, HLSL, sorry about that, high level shading language. That is the language that allows this engine to talk to your video card directly in order to determine how things look. You could think of it as a shader from other engines, or if you've done actual um, GL shading, it's the same thing. For Unreal, they've made this nice little editor here to allow you to basically condense things into a visual flow and layout for your shader itself. All of this is compiled down into the H HLSL itself, that way it's sent to the GPU properly. The nice thing is you just get a pretty layout and you can actually see everything in real time. So this right here, even though all it does is take inputs, it is actually your final node. It's your output node. It determines what you're going to see on the screen. So like right now, for example, over here we have a little preview. It's a little round sphere that's black. And it's because all of these default settings here, nothing's plugged in. And this is your default setting for your default basic main material. If I wanted it white, for example, I could always do something like this. Now, for example, we're just doing something so we can see taking this white value, plug it into my base color, and I get a white output. And that's just a simple basic example. We are going to cover each of these individual nodes in detail in later videos. But for now, we're just going to cover what they are and what we'd use them for. So we have our base color. This is something that's important to know, these actual first four things here. Unreal Engine 4 uses a PBR lighting model, physically based rendering. Its goal is to try to mimic how light works realistically in order to make things look realistic. Your older lighting models use like a diffuse workflow, diffuse specular, and basically you baked the lighting result into the diffuse map itself. So if you wanted something to look orange or torn or broken or metal or shiny, you'd have to use your artist program like Photoshop, draw it in, and then put it into your shader itself so that way it looked like you wanted it. The issue with that is you would have to design maybe how metal would look in winter and in fire and maybe in poison gas, like a green glow effect, or dirty. You'd have to design different variations because you'd have to basically bake the lighting in. With PBR, it's designed where you don't have to do that. You want to basically author it how it's supposed to look, and then your lighting in your world and other things affect it naturally, and it looks proper. So in other systems, this would be like a diffuse input or an albedo input. This is basically your base color. This is the base color of the item itself. It could be a texture map if you have, for example, um, a pair of jeans and it's going to have blue and maybe some red for rivet, black for rivets, and maybe some white for faded edges. That's perfectly fine, but it's your base color. It is not affected by light in any way, not affected by shadows, basically, for the most part. It doesn't have any shininess applied to it. That is what other inputs are for. It's your base color of your item. Under that, we have metallic. Basically, this is a zero to one input, and you can use it as a mask, and it determines how metallic the item is. So a common use for this, for example, let's say you have a pair of jeans, and on those jeans, you have buttons. 
little snap buttons. And those buttons are metallic. They have no texture on them at all. Let's say they're a, a slightly shiny black metallic. Well, you could use a mask where you have little round white because white is one and black is zero. You'd have little round white spots on the texture and then the rest of it was black. And basically that's going to tell this material here, your main material, that only those spe specific spots are metallic and the rest is not metallic. And that's how it's going to affect the actual output material. It's only going to make those individual spots that are as white as possible, as one as possible, be metallic. Now let's skip past specular and go to roughness. Roughness is actually the exact opposite of metallic. It still has zero to one, one being rough, zero being not rough, and it determines if the texture is rough or not rough. So in the case of our jeans, maybe it's going to look the exact opposite as our metallic mask. Everything's going to be white or a, a maybe a really light gray white. We don't want the jeans to be too rough, for example. And then it'll have a few round black spots where the metallic parts are because those are not rough at all. We want them completely smooth metallic. So your metallic and the roughness for the most part are going to be the opposites of each other. If it's not really rough, it might be metallic. If it's not really metallic, it might be rough. Keep in mind, it doesn't have to be metallic to not be rough. Plastic is a good example. You could have zero for metallic and zero for roughness, and that's going to give you basically a plastic look, a nice shiny plastic rubber ball, for example. Now we'll go back to specular. Specular is going to be basically the value of the specular highlights on the image itself. For the most part, it's left at a default of 0.5. It doesn't really have any effect on metal, and it only affects the specularity on non-metallic surfaces. For the most part, since this is a PBR workflow, roughness, metallic, base color are your normal primary inputs. Specular isn't used too much. It does come into effect for things like glass and things like that, and we'll cover that later. Under this, we have emissive color. Emissive color is basically the color of light that is emitted from the texture. And this one does not have to be a zero to one range. You, what you can do is overdrive it, and any value above one will basically make it look like it's starting to glow. Um, again, I'm not going to go into detail. We will cover all of these in more detail in the other parts of the videos. Right now, we're just covering what each one's for. So emissive is used if you want something to emit light and glow. Maybe like a wall light or an inset light or a metallic panel. Under this, we have opacity and opacity mask. Now, you can't see these, so let me go ahead and turn those on. This will be covered later on how we did that, but basically determining what type of blend mode, material domain, shading model, and if we're using tessellation, determines if things are turned on or off. These inputs are all white. That means they are active and are there will be affected by the output. Anything that is grayed out is inactive and nothing will happen in our shading model. Since I, since I went in and turned on translucent, basically opacity turned on, and opacity is basically how translucent or opaque something is. By default, when you create a new material, it's going to be opaque. Opaque basically means it is solid. It's not see-through. It's not transparent. So that's why opacity and opacity mask are not turned on because we have a solid object. If we want to use these, we'll, of course, turn them on. Opacity determines how, basically how solid something is. If it has a 1 for opacity, it's solid. If it has a 0 for opacity, it's translucent. You can see through it. Underneath that, we have opacity mask, which is... Kind of like opacity, but it's more in the terms of yes or no if it's on. It's a mask. Let's say, for example, you have a tree leaf, and you have a solid texture that's a square for the leaf. Now, the outside of the leaf itself is not solid. It's not opaque. It's transparent. So you may use an opacity mask to basically be the shape of the leaf and to tell your shader that only the leaf is solid, everything around it is transparent. So you're using a mask basically to block out things. Another nice use of it is, for example, you can make a checkerboard mask, 
and then you'll have basically every other pixel on your image transparent and every other pixel solid. So you can make some really cool effects. Below that we have normal. This is the, a normal map. This is standard. This has been around for materials. This is basically a way to give detail to an object by making it look like things are either recessed by inside the surface or brought forward from the surface as sort of like a bump. You could think of normals kind of like bump mapping if you've used bump mapping before. But basically normals give detail to an object by making things look like they're either raised from the surface or depressed into the surface. World position offset. This is something that allows you to change the offsets of the UVs on the actual material itself so you could easily fake an animation. You could use world position offset to slowly move the material that looks like water so it looks like the water is running without actually moving the physical item itself. You just have a world position offset change and it makes it look like you're running water or lava. Maybe you could use it to animate a flag waving without actually moving the physical item itself. It's a great way of moving things in the world. Under this we have world displacement and tessellation multiplier. These are basically the same things as a world position offset except it uses tessellation. Tessellation is a method of adding extra triangles to your item to give it more detail. So using world displacement and tessellation multiplier you could take a flat surface that let's say let's say you have a gravel walkway it's dirt and it's a flat surface using world displacement and tessellation multiplier you could actually make it where it looks like the rocks have a little bit of physical depth to them and it does that by adding triangles and such to your actual mesh itself now underneath that we have subsurface color this is one of our different mo shading models subsurface color Basically, if you think of your ear, if you were to look through your ear with a light on the other side of it, you could see color underneath the ear. Maybe you'll see blood vessels. Subsurface color basically allows you to have two different colors, and it puts the secondary color underneath the primary color, so that way when the light hits it at certain angles, you can kind of see below through the surface to the subsurface and see another color. Underneath that, we have clear coat. The clear coat is fairly similar to subsurface with the difference being it's meant more for like cars where you have maybe a thin clear coat. That's why it's called clear coat. Maybe you have a thin clear coat of plastic and then underneath that your actual material which may be like a blue. So if you've ever looked at a newer car it is very similar to that. It's similar to car paint and lacquer coating on paint. That's what clear coat is. Roughness is basically how rough the clear coat will be. Now underneath that we have ambient inclusion. Ambient occlusion is basically faking shadows inside of shadows. Let's say you have a rock and it has a lot of crevices and cracks in it. Inside those crevices and cracks in normal world lighting situations, those will actually be darkened by the shadows themselves inside of it, bouncing off of themselves. Ambient occlusion basically allows you to bake in extra shadow details inside of the shadow details where there would be cracks, crevices, holes, and things like that. Refraction is... Oh, there we go. Refraction is basically light reflecting refracting back through itself. It's usually seen in glass, water, ice, and things like that where you're looking through a solid surface and then it seems like the light or the image on the other side looks different. It's the light reflect refracting inside of itself. And then our last one is pixel depth offset. This was added recently. There's no actual documentation that I can find that covers it completely. But basically it's a way of you can add extra detail. It's a it's a depth buffer per pixel material offset. I don't have a primary use for it yet. I haven't found a good example, but of course I will cover it, so I will find and make a good example. But for now, it's pixel depth offset. If you're making a material, you'll know if you'll need it or not. So this is going to cover our first video. It was pretty long at 15 minutes or so. 
and it covers all the basics of what our main material has. Main material takes inputs. It is the output itself. The output itself is what determines what it looks like. There are 11 property sections in here with tons of options which we're going to cover. We're going to cover in the videos coming up different examples on what each of these inputs are as well as cover in detail what each of our different property sections are. This is going to take a while, but we're going to have some good details. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below.